Okay, well, it's um, 10 o'clock Second Life time, or 12 my time, I'm in Texas. Um, does anyone happen to know why, we, as we get started, does anyone happen to know why uh, Second Life is in um, Pacific Standard Time, or West Coast Time, or whatever you want to call it? You can, you can write it there as I'm doing, but in any case, uh, welcome to uh, the Science Circle, and welcome back to our current members, and I love to see, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, actually I was born there, they think, but you're right, uh, Linden Labs, in other words, uh, back when Second Life was started, they never thought that maybe, oh, ah. so never, never thought that perhaps um, uh, this would be come as big as it does. Same thing with Facebook and other things. So uh, they just decided to use their time and that's where it is. Linden Labs, the designer of um, Second Life. Okay, so as I mentioned before, uh, please ask questions, comment, comment on what I said, answer other people's questions, share links. Um, <laughs> well, they think it is, okay. So, and, you know, engage in what we discussed today. We were just talking earlier about learning to do this. In other words, learning to uh, interact with each other uh, besides face-to-face -face and uh, what it allows us to do. I'm sure there's people from around the world here today. Um, welcome, welcome. I see a lot of new names. Okay, so... Um, this is the third in a series of kind of opening sessions when I'm kind of feeling out, uh, exploring the idea of a, of a regular permanent class. Yeah, there you go, okay. <laughs> and exploring science and second life. In future sessions, we'll talk about science in the news, visit sites in second life to demonstrate science, talk about science behind our science circle um, presentations. Which, by the way, if you're interested in some in the past, we've got uh, both uh, little mini theaters, a uh, kind of international education center here that's over um, on, in one of the corners. And then also at our website, you'll see uh, presentations from the past. We've been doing this for about 12 years. Um, and in this particular section, I'd like to explore the concept of time. Now, time is kind of dear to all of us, and I've been fascinated with the topic for over 50 years since I learned about relativity and how time and space are not absolute. So, so let's take a look at what we're doing to, yeah, very timely subject. Okay, so Happy New Year, or is it? Okay, so how come we have, whoops. So how come we have two New Year's? Uh, we had one just a couple weeks ago. Um, it uh, actually landed about, or lasted for about 15 days. And then we've got one that was a couple months ago. Yeah, Year of the Rat. Yeah, so it really depends on your perspective of time and your system for measuring and stuff like that. And so we're going to take a little bit look at that today. Year of the Rat, or are you in the Year of the Rat? Okay. So... Um, you're an optometrist. <laughs> okay. You're the optometrist. Okay. So, in any case, I'd like to explore. This isn't a comprehensive exploration of time. I mean, that'd take a lot more than an hour. Uh, but I'd like to explore kind of three areas uh, namely, how we think of time and space, the physical scientific basis of time, in other words, how we reference time, and then how we measure it. In other words, it's kind of an abstraction of the notion of time beyond the physical uh, references. I think, therefore, yeah, uh, if you're lucky, as, as I tell people, um, if you're lucky, you grow old. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is, is let me put the this uh, video link here so it's easier to get to and, instead of having to type all that stuff. But this is a video that link. Let's take a second to do it. It's about, um, wow, well, three minutes to do it. Click on that and then go see what the difficulty of talking about time is. So, about 31,536,000 seconds ago, I was tasked to write a piece 
about time. Time. A broad topic to say the least, but because of my competitive nature, I agreed to let the pin go until system overload still the stroke. Bro, when speaking about time, where do I begin? Do I start from the beginning? I mean, do I begin with the Big Bang, Magellan, or the Mayans? Should I speak about pendulums or the space-time continuum? I mean, how do I begin to describe something so vast, so infinite as time? And is it truly infinite? Or does it have a finite end exactly how and when did it all begin? Did it all start with this cosmic bubble that would expand and give birth to time as we know it? Is it more or less complex than that? Have our attempts to measure it only taught us the surface of what it is? I mean, oscillating atoms gave us the clue of what time it is, but neglected to mention what time is. Still, you must admit we've come so far from crystals, pendulums, and sundials. Spinning planets in rotation around a star. Boy, that took a while. <laughs> I feel I've been here a spell or two longer than I intended to. Come on, let's continue. Let's move forward and ride this arrow of time through beautiful entropy. Yes, indeed. Please believe it gets messy. I mean, our concept of time isn't so orderly, is it? Especially when even the way we experience time is only a perception and an illusion. Sidebar. Is chronophobia a legitimate fear? Never mind that. Let me double back. Besides, if it's true that everything that has happened, is happening, and will happen already exists at once, then wouldn't time itself tell us that both my perception and your perception of it, though different, are real? Imagine that. Time. But quantitative and relative. And according to my watch, I ain't got moments to waste. And if there are multiple realities that exist at this given moment, then theoretically, not only am I out of time, but I have plenty of it. How confusing. Wait, let me take some time here, slow down here, give me some time here, yeah. Give me a second, give me a minute, give me an hour. Our time is not ours. Let me be brief, because in the end you don't need to fully understand what time is in order to see the beauty of measuring it. It's more than defining a second so that when the clock's ticking, it has atomic precision. It's standardization, it's measurements of duration, it's discovery and the search for new applications. See, today is understanding our location for global navigation, and tomorrow, well, only time will tell. Okay, well, uh, if you're done with the video, um, it's by the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, and it kind of covers a lot of the aspects of time. It's so it's a good little video that uh, covers most of the stuff we're talking about today. Um, and yeah, uh, exactly. Share those sorts of things like the physical nature of time, etc., like that. I, uh, and I've had other people share other things too. Uh, here again, my I really like it when we do um, inter a lot of interactivity in these presentations here. Okay, so let's take a look at what um, kind of the philosophy philosophy of time. Is it fixed or relative? Is it linear or cyclical? Is it real or a mental construct? And so, well, it's fixed in that we can define it. In the video, is talking about he had a cesium atom in there. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure. Okay, so in any case, uh, it's fixed in that we can define it precisely relative to uh, characteristics of physical objects like the moon or sun or the frequency of electromagnetic radiation of uh, helium, I mean, excuse me, uh, cesium atom or objects we create like clocks. Um, but it's relative if we try to measure it, uh, those same characteristics under acceleration or strong gravity or when objects are moving really fast relative to us. Um, how many people have ever experienced Time slowing down during a crisis. If you've lived long enough, I bet you you have. Anybody out there? Or I, I've read a book recently about why we dream. And so in dreaming, actually, yeah, every <laughs> faculty meeting. Okay, but also in dreaming, uh, we may only dream for minutes, but it seems like a much longer time. In other words, they found that actually in dreams, uh, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio as far as time goes. Um, okay, what about it being linear or cyclical? Part of that's cultural. In, it may seem linear if we kind of think of 
time is progressing towards something or away from the past. Or if we consider that each repetition of events or patterns is not exactly the same, or if you've ever tried to return to the past and found that you haven't, yeah, um, you completely lose track of time. Yeah, I kind of concentrate on stuff. I've had several instances where time, I only knew that seconds actually really occurred, but it sure slowed down, and I had to make some really quick decisions uh, in it for life and death purposes. Um, but time can also seem cyclical because we sense patterns uh, that repeat in nature. And I'll talk more about the patterns here in a minute when we talk about how time is measured. Okay, so is time real or is it a mental construct? Um, well, it's real in that things are real and change is real, but if nothing actually happened, in other words, if we just sat here, would time really exist? Would, could you sense time? Well, certainly things inside you, there's no such thing as everything just coming to a halt because the chemical reactions inside you, all of that would continue moving. So you'd continue aging even if you were in a place where um, uh, everything had kind of uh, slowed down and become static and you couldn't sense it. Um, moving, uh, but time is also a construct when we kind of define it as a fourth dimension and such. So it, it, in actuality, it's true for all of that. And thank, thanks for sharing tagline. Any, anyone else has kind of an experience like that, let me know. Well, same thing with space. Space and time are related when we talk about time being a, a fourth dimension. Um, Okay, yeah, I'll have to take a look at that. Um, okay, when we, so space, what's interesting to me is as I study some of these things is, is uh, what continues to surprise me, and the same thing as surprises me when we have these presentations in Second Life, is our commonalities. Uh, these days we seem to be so much in these silos of them versus us, at least in the United States, that uh, remembering that we have much more in common than our differences throughout the world is something important. And the more I study, the more I uh, find about this. Uh, so in earlier years, we were a lot closer to the Earth. And we kind of looked around and wondered about what lay beyond and what our part was in it. And so uh, in very early days, thousands of years ago, um, we kind of thought of the Earth as flat because if you're standing in one spot, it appears to be so. And those types of concepts were in both uh, very early Chinese culture as well, as well as early Greek and other cultures. Um, we've learned, of course, that's not the case, but uh, also the concepts of early, of many layers in worlds that we uh, could not yet experience. Um, disc world? <laughs> yeah, well, there's also... Uh, uh, a good book out uh, on stuff like Flat World. I don't know. That's an old, older book, etc. Where there's one dimension rather than two. Uh, interesting stuff. Um, Rain World. I haven't uh, seen that one. Okay, but in any case, the concept of many layers in other worlds, uh, where we believe, you know, that we would go when we died, also mirrored our earthly uh, hierarchy. And you can see that that was um, in more, more than uh, one religion that that was true. Okay, so time and space um, are both in common uh, concepts and some differences. Okay, so let's take a look at our philosophy of time. When we take a look at a philosophy of time, um, obviously it's gone back many years, in other words. And one of the things in common uh, throughout cultures is this idea of cycles, of, of ages of the world. And so, for example, you, uh, <laughs> the ring series, okay. Um, so you can find it in, in the Vedas, uh, four cycles of creation, deterioration, uh, and then destruction, four world ages uh, in the Mayan uh, world and in other cultures. Now, what I'd like you to do is also take a look at um, this video. It's a, and this is the last video I think I'd like you to, look at for today uh, is 
is this one. This is Mayan philosophy of, of creation and time before they encountered the Maya, excuse me, but the, the European world. In other words, this is written in codexes and stuff like that. Tell me if you see any differences, okay? I'm going to give you the YouTube thing, and it takes about three minutes, so please take a look at this and then come on back, and we'll uh, uh, talk. This is... Well, hey, that's uh, better than some of the, <laughs> I'd rather be made a cool than some of the other uh, theories. But notice what's similar, in other words, at least similar to a lot of Western creation stories, um, is that it said all is stillness, and there was water, um, and then separated the earth and sky, and levels of uh, the upper world and underworld, and humans created from mud, which was the very first one, by the way and then destroyed in a flood, and there were brothers, and all the different types of things that are, are set, and then they became the sun and the moon and such. So uh, very similar. And so this, this story uh, before uh, that did not have, have uh, European influence, it kind of makes you wonder whether some of these stories go back long enough to have been, uh, you know, maybe tens or hundreds of thousands of years um, so that they became common throughout the world as people migrated out of uh, Africa and beyond. Um, that's, like I said, it's always interesting to me that to find that they're, um, yeah, Q. <laughs> so in any case, to find the similarities in what we think. Okay, you'll also notice that even 
back in the early Greek days in, in Europe area that the that they knew that the Earth was round, and Aristarchus and, uh, made a case that the sun was at the center of it all. So our misconceptions of the Middle Ages and stuff are incorrect a bit. Let's take a look at that time period. In other words, people knew, uh, and, and certainly people like Columbus and stuff knew that the world were round, because otherwise, why sail west trying to reach the Indies? And so it's just that, uh, does anyone happen to know, because I've read an account of why um, Columbus misjudged um, the distance. In other words, yes, exactly. There you go. Excellent. Good. Yeah, he thought it was smaller. And, and what I've read is actually, and I haven't found it yet. If anybody actually finds it, let me know. But there's, there's references in some of the books that were not included. In other words, they're included perhaps in the Catholic Bible, but not in uh, Reformation Bibles. That um, And some other books uh, that were written, that kind of alluded to the world being smaller by about a third. So he actually thought that by sailing west, you could reach the Indies sooner. It's just that uh, no one knew, of course, about the Pacific Ocean except for the uh, people that live there <laughs> and that sort of thing. Yeah, the Apocrypha was the name of the of the of that group of books. But if anybody actually finds a reference of why Columbus thought it was uh, smaller, I'd love to know that. Okay, so moving on, let's take a look then at the Middle Ages and what people thought about time there. And one of the things is you'll notice that uh, well, exactly, and uh, for Mel uh, Mel Kenzie there. There was a longitude, this is kind of skipping ahead, but there was a longitude prize uh, in, in fact, there was a good movie called Longitude, a good book called Longitude, um, that talks about that longitude prize, which was worth about, say, $10 million today for the first chronometer that was actually accurate enough to uh, measure time on a rolling ship to within a fifth of a second uh, per a day it was very good and so you could actually measure your longitude latitude's easy because of the stars longitude is far harder uh, to measure okay <laughs> yeah baragon you always come up with these interesting things um yeah it was everybody did i mean because they had measured it uh, here again i only have a certain amount of time uh to present this but um they had measured for example going down into egypt and finding a well that was quite vertical and then measuring it on certain times of the, of the uh, middle of the day and finding uh, what the angle was. And they were good within about 2% of the actual uh, distance around the, the Earth. So they knew, you know, they knew long ago uh, about how big the Earth was and it was fear and stuff. And people didn't forget that stuff. They knew about it. Um, you know, they knew about it in the Middle Ages, too. Okay, so in any case, let's take a look at the Ptolemaic, Ptolemaic solar system, because it has a lot to do with our current calendar, believe it or not, and to other calendars around the world. And so here we see Ptolemy wearing a crown like a king, and instead of the world with the sun at the center and the Earth in orbit, um, basically you're looking at the, the Ptolemy system. He preferred an imperfect Earth at the center and then the perfect heavens above. And so when the Roman Empire collapsed, ancient Greek and Egyptian texts were preserved in the Muslim world and in far, far corners of Europe like the uh, Ireland. And then, of course, India and China had their own texts, plus their own waxing and waning of civilizations and such. And, and in some cases, except for like the Silk Road and others uh, who, like Marco Polo and stuff, sometimes ideas took centuries or even a thousand years to go to uh, traverse but through encounters with the uh, not so friendly encounters with the Muslim world uh, the ancient idea or the ideas of the ancients uh, were rediscovered in Europe and then and unfortunately became kind of dogma in the church when something becomes dogma and something become near religious uh, it's very difficult to change a way of thinking so the idea of uh, geocentrism and in other words, the Earth at the center and circular orbits and such like that. Uh, it was very difficult to change people's minds about that. Um, so in any case, this philosophy of time is a 
Well, it, it was based on some science. In other words, it, you're talking about people a thousand years later uh, basing their thoughts on someone in the 100s AD uh, who thought about the, the system. But here again, why didn't they base it on, you know, Aristophanes said, oh, the sun's in the center. So in other words, it's kind of, uh, yeah, it's kind of science that you want to accept rather than uh, talking of, in other words, rather than kind of um, measuring it yourself and figuring out how things really work. Okay, but this is a rich area that we can explore um, on its own presentation, really. But there's a couple things I'd like to take a look at first. One is the idea, but one of the things, the reason I wanted to do about the Ptolemaic system, because it's actually embedded in the Western calendar and several calendars today, even though we know that it, the sun is at the solar system. We'll be, come back to that in just a second. Um, so in any case, let's take a look at light, what's called life or life expectancy. Uh, if you're really young, you usually don't think about this stuff. <laughs> but if you're not as young, uh, time is, starts to become a resource. Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, yeah, they, yeah, scientific method, at least the way we do it today, had not yet be developed. It was kind of developed over the last uh, couple centuries, particularly in the 1800s. And then in some in the 1700s, and even before. Um, so in any case, with the idea of life expectancy, you could take almost any country and it will look something like this. Of course, in some countries, there's a lot more mortality uh, early, uh, as the red line here, which is from 1950 in the United States, alludes to. And then kind of, if you can live past 20, uh, you can probably live for a while. And then there's a time when it, uh, there's a greater percentage of people who die, and then it kind of falls off rapidly. It all depends on what country and stuff you're in. And so in this particular one, when, when somebody says life expectancy, what do they mean? Uh, this is kind of a concept of time that's uh, bandied around, bowed a little bit, and I think it's misunderstood, is that um, if you look at the, the lines right there, if you're born in around 1950, then 80% will live past age 57, but by the time you get to 68, that, that's the, the mean, which means that 50% of people will have died by age 68, and that 50% of people will live beyond that. Um, but only 20% will live beyond 83 or so. Now, if you happen to be talk, looking at Social Security, which here again, you have to be a little older to think about that. Yeah, it's the mean versus the median, or the, the median, excuse me. Uh, yeah, versus, in other words, you got I have average versus. Um, oh, well, good, excellent. Yeah, as, as a matter of fact, yeah, my dad's nearing that too. And um, they just had, I, you know, you have to be a little older than uh, definitely bucking the curve. In other words, if you look at the curve there, definitely. Okay, so, but for Social Security, for example, pe for people who live to 68, the what they say in the Social Security, oh, I'm sorry, uh, boo, maybe somebody can help. Um, um, our visitor. Okay, so uh, what they're saying is that the average age of death is 85. But what they really are not saying is that a lot of people will die a long time before 85. So in other words, it depends on um, um, your perspective. Okay. In other words, of what time is in there. Now, the other thing of time, and I'd like to ask you is, what are the types of things that you heard about time? And then I'm going to move to the next section here. Is that, for example, time is money. Why would people say um that. When I was young, it seems like, okay, tell, tell me if anybody else agrees, but in my life anyway, it seems like if you had a lot of time, you didn't have any money. <laughs> and then if you had a lot of money, you didn't have any time because you're busy making the money. So you kind of have, have to find a happy medium in between. Uh, but so, I, so when I was in high school and I was thinking about time, because uh, I didn't have any money, um, I was thinking about money. And so I was saying, well, what I found, or what I thought about was money, um, well, uh, now, yes, but back then, you know, 
when you uh, so in any case what I was thinking about was the reason time is money is because you could actually make everything yourself and of course people did and people still do uh, around the world but uh, the thing is you'd have to learn about how to make it you'd have to make it yourself so essentially money is time or time is money because you can just go out give some people some pieces of paper or uh, online and you get something that would also would take you a lot of time to make or a lot of time to figure out how to make so that so time is money in that regard and then of course money is power if you want stuff in other words if you allow it to be so i was thinking think about uh, what other types of things you think about for time but let's go on to the next section which is essentially well that's a very good point and that's kind of uh, in other words do we uh, find that time is actually a matter of orderly passage of events or uh, whatever. In other words, the idea is let's take a look at that part right now. In other words, the scientific or physical basis of time. And one of the things that we're really good at and really is required for survival is seeing patterns. In other words, we have to be able to see patterns uh, to, to know where food is, to know um, where uh, places that you want to avoid or what might happen when we encounter others or stuff. So in other words, we look for patterns even when they don't exist. And so it's how we make sense of the world and predict what's coming next and stuff, which helps our survival. It's also how we measure time. And so we kind of see patterns sometimes where they exist, sometimes where they don't. And so let's kind of take a look at how time, uh, how we measured time and what was behind it. Now, you may have to zoom in on this one. It's got a lot of information on here, but essentially what you've got is, let's take a look at internal time. In other words, if we were in a cave, which was a famous experiment uh, long ago, uh, when people, uh, they actually put people in cave, and anybody happen to know it was an experiment back in the 1930s, I believe, uh, where they had people in a cave for months, and anybody happen to know what happened then? Yeah, yeah, uh, thank you for the comments. There's always some interesting things there. Um, but basically, we did have, uh, they, yeah, they, they lost days, but not so much as you'd think, because their sleep patterns changed, but it was still, it was just a little bit more than 24 hours. Uh, so they found out that we do have this pattern that we keep. It was just not exactly 24 hours, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, uh, probably around there. I don't have the exact dates with it. But you also notice that it's not just when we go to sleep. By the way, let me let me bring that up. The reason we go to sleep is there's two things going on. There is a chemical called adenosine. Adenosine kind of, the moment we wake up, this stuff kind of starts dripping into our system. And what it does is it's the one that will eventually put us to sleep. And what caffeine does is it inhibits the sites where adenosine would connect. And so it is as if uh, we're not uh, continuing to be become t more tired and tired. The problem is, is that once the caffeine uh, runs out, more or less, in our system, uh, which, by the way, takes quite a while. The half-life of caffeine, I think, is six or eight hours. So if you have a cup late in the afternoon, you might not be able to sleep quite as well. Um, but what happens when the caffeine runs out is essentially you crash, kind of like uh, a sugar crash and stuff like that too. And you and because adenosine continues to drip. Now melatonin you might recognize is not the same as adenosine. What melatonin is, it's kind of the day and night thing. And so what happens is it's light. It's uh, daylight, more lighty, 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 and then all of a sudden it becomes dusk. And that's the cue in your body for to release melatonin, which basically says, oh, it's night, we should go to sleep. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for coming, and I understand very much how first life has a draw, and so thank you very much. But you can see this again on the website. In other words, it's being recorded. Okay. Um, you can catch the rest of it. So in any case, in circadian rhythms, you'll see that the rest of our body here um, has various times when it's good. So for you guys that want to 
say, need stuff that uh, darkness is important for our health. Exactly. Uh, melatonin is secreted in the darkness, and it's the one. So it's a combination of adenosine and then melatonin uh, that will help you to get a good sleep. So if you really want a good sleep, by the way, is go outside toward the uh, before it gets dark and, you know, sit there, watch the sunset, whatever, and then it'll trigger your body into this circadian rhythm going, oh, hey, I'm, uh, I'm seeing it. In other words, sitting inside uh, at a computer watching Second Life all day is <laughs> or a computer or anything inside is probably not the best way to get your system or keep your system uh, in check and have a good sleep. Uh, if you do stuff that uh, requires fast reaction time or good coordination or muscular efficiency, notice that that's in the afternoon. And, and well, wow, no, no, no. <laughs> I reckon everything in moderation. I recognize. Uh, second life, but in other words, sitting at a computer with blue lights um, is maybe not the greatest thing to do all day. In other words, uh, we are natural creatures, and so we need that sunlight, and so go out and um, remember that the world is out there and stuff. Okay, the other thing you'll notice is the uh, when we go to sleep, you'll notice that there's uh, a hypnogram down there, bottom left of the slide which basically shows our sleep patterns. And we go into these hour and a half cycles during the night at the very beginning. Yeah, I know, daylight savings time, uh, working nights, um, travel, we'll all mess everything up. Um, and then you have to get back in sync again. So in any case, when we go to sleep, you'll notice that there are one and a half hour cycles. And the very first ones, you get this really deep sleep, which essentially, if you read about sleep, I'm going to do a presentation on sleep. It's very fascinating. But whatever, it kind of flushes things out. And then you have, and then you go into REM sleep, where you're associating new ideas with things go and stuff. It's very, very interesting. Uh, well, you're right, and it, and it seems to. In other words, I, I know when I was in the military that even when I was on a ship, that there were certain uh, cycles of, uh, that I could feel in my, in my body going on as far as when I was alert or not and such like that. And that's a good thing to know. Now, we talked a little while ago about uh, climate change, and we do from time to time, but here's one of the things that actually plants and animals, um, they have their own cycles, and one of the reasons why climate change can be a problem is essentially in migratory birds. Let's take that. Okay. They have evolved over time. They don't just go like, hey, gee, it's spring break, let's go on a, or, or it's summer vacation, let's go on a you know, migrate. Uh, they did it for particular purposes, and that was because of the availability of food, uh, temperature, um, habitats, all that stuff. So they're timed every spring to come back up north, in this case, uh, if you're in the southern hemisphere, it's the opposite, but essentially to coincide with peak availability of food. So what happens in warmer temperatures is the plants get their leaves earlier, uh, the insects uh, come out earlier, eat the leaves. The leaves get to be uh, harder and less uh, supple and less nutritious. And so what happens is they come up north. Uh, they're already a week or two behind. The little birds are born. They, get, they have less food. The little babies starve. And then the populations decline. So in other words, that's part of what happens, all these related cycles in for climate change. Yeah, uh, marine en environments as well. Here again, this is a, is a subject which could easily occupy uh, several presentations. And I'm just kind of touching on some of these. Maybe it'll give you an idea for a presentation. But um, this disruption is happening all the time when you get these cycles out of, out of uh, uh, sync with each other. Okay, the other thing about measuring stuff, and the reason why we have to have calendars and stuff, is none, is, is it's not like in the old days where they thought that the heavens were perfect and round circles and stuff. I mean, the Earth's orbit is a little bit elliptical. Uh, we have a tilt uh, to the Earth, uh, all these sorts of things that, that happen. And so um, if you actually try to measure all of this, you're going to be... Uh, and measure it precisely, you're going to be very frustrated. 
because, for example, um, the uh, and and by the way, it doesn't stay the same over time. In other words, the tilt of the Earth has over forty-one thousand years has gone from twenty-two degrees up to twenty-four and a half degrees. We happen to be at twenty-three and a half and increasing right now. I think um, the kind of elliptic elliptical shape of the uh, Earth's uh, orbit around the sun uh, changes also. It goes from almost nothing to uh, quite uh, more than it does right now. Um, the moon is, the moon, by the way, is receding at 38 millimeters per year away from the Earth. So essentially, our hours back in the dinosaur days, or a little bit beyond that, it was about 23 and a half or 23 hours in day. Uh, yeah, there you go. Exactly what Di said. You can you can swip, swatch that, uh, um, flip that around and see you know how many hours in a day uh, by taking that equation, just uh, making you know, and it's well proved. Absolutely. So there's almost nothing that is, and then our uh, so everything. So in other words, actually t basing time on objects out there in the solar system is kind of not going to give you some very good answers when you're talking about parts of a second. Uh, let's take a look at the, the Mars. What about people move, living on Mars? Uh, what if we had, what if we were on Mars instead of Earth? Well, it's by coincidence that there's the Earth's, or excuse me, Mars is, um, goes around in, in just a little bit longer than the same time as the than the uh, Earth does, in other words, in 24 and a half Earth hours, called a soul. If anyone watched the movie The Martian, uh, you'll remember the word soul on there. That's uh, the Mars day. But would we even have months? Because the month is essentially designed on the moon's uh, orbit. In the case of uh, Mars, you've got Phobos and Deimos, which are, uh, one of them goes around three times a day <laughs> and loses six Feet per century, by the way, in distance. It's getting closer and closer to uh, Mars, and it's going to impact in about 50 million years. So if you're around, uh, put that on your calendar. Or it could break up into a ring system. And uh, so it depends on uh, where you live as to uh, what you could use uh, for timing system. But Now, by the way, I'm going to show you in a bit that actually there's calendar systems that you have used Jupiter and Venus as well. Okay. Well, yeah, Syzygy, but they had to use something. <laughs> so what they really probably, yeah, I know, and it, and it had to do with Earth Day. So somebody made it up long ago, and, you know, some of these are confusing. Okay, so let's take a look now as to, in other words, since some of these are not very steady, and they knew that long ago. Let's take a look at some calendar systems, because essentially calendar systems are an abstraction of time. In other words, they're not they're they're kind of loosely based on uh, time, but they're an abstract. And so let's take a look in particular. There's three calendar systems I want to take a look at. There's lots of them, by the way. Uh, there's about forty of them <laughs> at least. Um, but let's take a look at the one that's used in the Western world and particularly in economics and stuff. That is the Gregorian or Julian calendar and Chinese calendar and Mayan calendar. Okay, so here are the calendar systems in the world. There's quite a few of them. There's about 40 of them. There's about six in common use. And you can see, You can see that there are basically secular calendars. In other words, ones used in civil societies, and then ones used in religion, at religious societies. There's indigenous calendars also, uh, um, and so you've got, and then also ones like, for example, the. And please, somebody correct me if I, because I'm probably mispronouncing it, but the Hijri or the the Islamic calendar. Um, that's based, of course. Uh, since the time of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, you've got one in uh, India, uh, which basically it's the year uh, 1942. Uh, Thailand, uh, very old year. And, and then in Japan, um, and also in uh, Korea, 
uh, based on, and people used to do it in other places, is based on the year of the emperor or the reign, the person that's reigning, um, that sort of thing. So, for example, there was a new emperor in Japan, and so it's kind of the first year. It started last August, I believe, and so it's the first year of the calendar there. Now, by the way, for you guys old enough to remember Y2K, anybody remember Y2K? Y2K. Okay. Yep. Okay. So one of the reasons Japan did not have as much problems, uh, why not to, <laughs> as, uh, hey, there's quite a few people. Anybody count how many people we got today? It's kind of a nice number there. Um, in any case, the um, reason Japan didn't have as many problems as in other people that had gone, gone by the Gregorian calendar, where the year was 2000, was a lot of the uh, systems were based on the Japanese calendar. So it wasn't the year 2000, only the year 2000. Uh, for nations whose computers and technology was based on the Gregorian calendar. So what do we mean by the Gregorian calendar and some of the other ways we base? Well, let's first take a look at kind of the uh, precision of time. Uh, uh, somebody mentioned back earlier about longitude and about being able to time it. Well. Long ago, of course, you know, they have sundials, and sundials are really great for local time, but if you were to actually measure them over a year, their accuracy is only about, is, is only as accurate as, uh, because we've got these elliptical orbits and stuff, so they're not terribly um, uh, accurate over a long time. So then you had, okay, here's another name I'm not quite sure how to pronounce, maybe uh, somebody get Huygen, uh, clock there. Uh, was uh, uh, mechanical clock, and then Harrison's marine chronometer. That's the one that they finally, he got a big prize, um, which was worth about 10 million US dollars today, uh, that you could actually be on a rolling ship, it would account for motion, etc. And it was one where you could, um, yeah, exactly, um, one-fifth second per day. That was pretty nice. Now, we actually measure the second by the cycles or the frequency of radiation emitted by uh, one electron falling to a lower orbit in a cesium-133 atom, which is a non-radioactive version of cesium. That's our current measurement of uh, what a second is. And then if you wanted to have clocks, which we have, and wanted to get them more accurate, you've got, for example, atomic clock, which is in 1967 was the first one. It was accurate to three. 30 billionths of a second, but in this last year, they developed a quantum clock that was uh, good to one second every 33 billion years. That's pretty darn accurate. And the actual year, if you look at that equation on the bottom, if you look at it, what it basically is saying, as we talked about it, is that uh, it changes uh, based on, um, um, and that's why we have like leap seconds and stuff. Yeah, uh, and you're right, and we could talk about the tropical year versus sidereal year versus the... <laughs> so, yeah, uh, and it all depends on whether you're referencing the um, stars in the background or you're referencing where it actually returns in orbit and all that good stuff like that. So, yeah, that gets very complicated, too. Now, here's an interesting thing for you guys that may not know, is how come we call the days of the week the way we do. And so this actually dates back to the Ptolemaic system. And you'll find this on several different calendars around the world. And it was because, yeah, equinox versus, versus fixed started, exactly. Okay, so, uh, but then you'd know. Okay, so in any case, back in the old days, if you actually look at the uh, way we thought um, the planets were in relationship to the sun and the earth, it was actually, we thought uh, that there's the Earth, and then the Moon's closer, and then Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And they also thought that, hey, these are heavenly bodies, and they're made by the gods, or God, and so uh, they rule things on Earth. This is still uh, part of astrology, astrology, not astronomy, but astrology around the world today. And so if you actually look at the first hour, and you say, okay, the first hour is ruled by Saturn, the second one by Jupiter, the third by Mars, Sun, Venus, Mercury, Moon. And if you follow that, I've got it there. 
through the 24 hours, then this in the next day, the um, it's the sun that rules the first hour, and then the sec third day, it's the moon, and then there's Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, and Venus. And so, uh, if you look at a if you look at what the days of the week are in a Latin based language, uh, like Spanish or Italian or French or whatever, you'll see that it's based on Mars and Mercury and Jupiter and Venus. It's much more obvious, but in English, it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So what's actually happening is, since English is based on Germanic language, is that they substituted the Germanic or Norse gods. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got two, God of War, is instead of Mars, and Odin or Woden instead of Mercury, and Thor for Thor's day, Thursday, and then Freya uh, for Friday. Yes. <laughs> so, the, so the idea, in any case, is that this is marvelous uh, conglomeration of things that are from a couple thousand years ago before uh, Renaissance time period of how we thought this all this looked. Uh, about gods and goddesses, yes. So yeah, is is Woden's or Woden's day? But it, it's the it's the idea of uh, Woden or Odin, uh, which, which by the way, this is even earlier because they thought Thor was basically more important than Odin at that time. But whatever, that sort of thing. So in other words, this is a combination of astronomy, astrology, gods and goddesses, Roman system, Germanic system, modern day. I mean, it's really quite something. And by the way, if you want a copy of these, I'll have a copy of some of these um, presentations and stuff uh, on this island. Well, both scientific, but also mythological and, and all that stuff. It's, it's culture. It's human culture. Just rather fascinating. Okay. So now let's take a look at some of the differences in the way they do the uh, days of the week around the world. Uh, here again, a lot of stuff crammed in that one slide. You might want to take a look at it. But... There it is, by the way. Uh, myths are definitely a treasure of knowledge. Uh, in fact, actually, well, <laughs> on, on Baragon, uh, yeah, it's, it's um, myths are definitely a treasure of knowledge. Let, let me take just one. Here again, I, I've got about eight minutes here. But in the Northwest California, there is a legend of two gods, which were basically the volcanoes. Uh, having a battle, and one of them won, and the other kind of blew its top. Okay, well, if they actually looked back at the time period, what they found was there were two. It was the volcano that uh, became Crater Lake and uh, Mount Shasta that they found about 12,000 years ago that they erupted, and one of them became Crater Lake. And so essentially you're talking about myths that had a definite grain of truth because they had been handed down over centuries uh, as gods and, you know, gods fighting, but essentially it was two volcanoes and they were able to trace it geologically uh, to confirm that. And I thought, you know, those sorts of things are very uh, fascinating. Or the idea of, say, Noah's Ark and the there's a, there's a thought that uh, it could be the Black Sea uh, where it uh, had water from the Mediterranean basically going into the Black Sea in other words, a lot of these very old types of uh, actual real events that became mytho mythologized um, became part of mythology. Okay, so in any case, uh, internationally, the first day of the week is Monday. I mean, it's ISO 8601. But if you have yeah, that, okay. So in some places in the world, Sunday is the first day of the week. In the Middle East, it's often Saturday. Uh, Please correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, if you know, if I'm not correct, I research this stuff. But I'm certainly no expert on in, on parts of it. And then on Friday in the Maldives, uh, for some reason, that's the first day of the week. And then there's the different week links. Uh, in the Soviet Union, uh, it was a five-day work week in the 1930s. Uh, the Roman uh, calendar had an eight-day week. And the French Revolution, they tried a ten-day. Week. So, you know, how long the week is, it varies. And then um, you've got some cultures, uh, instead of using kind of mythological names, 
uh, or gods and goddesses, they mark the days of the week with numbers. Uh, and then in East Asia, you have some of the uh, elements. In other words, sun, moon, fire, water, wood, metal, gold, earth. Those are the actual names of the days of the week. So it's very fascinating when you look at that. And then when does the day of the week or when does the day of the year start? Well, in the Julian Gregorian calendar, it's the 1st of January. But in Europe in the Middle Ages, it was basically around Easter time or uh, the, the uh, vernal equinox, or in some cases um, in September. And of course, it depends on what, uh, in what religion and what calendar you use. It can be any number of times around the year because it, they're lunar calendars rather than solar or uh, solar lunar calendars. Uh, so it, it's very fascinating. In other words, I think one thing to take into consideration is First of all, we have a lot in common, but there's nothing really absolute. <laughs> and the more you learn about these things, the more you learn about the really fascinating differences uh, and how we end up with what we have today. Um, so one of, the, one of the more fascinating things, if you use the Gregorian calendar, in other words, the one that says this is the year 2020, and it's February 8th, or the 8th of February, is if you look at how that, here again, this is one where you need a mic microphone, uh, a magnifying glass to see the slide, you might have to zoom in, um, but these will be made available, I'll have them uh, available. And so in any case, if you look back at that calendar, there were one time, first of all, what was the original basis of calendars? And, and uh, in other words, if you look back at the calendar, it's only 10 months. <laughs> Was it? Okay. Well, that's good to know. Okay, but the, um, there was originally, they, they could care less about winter because you couldn't grow. In other words, they're agricultural calendars or religious calendars. So winter, so for exa example, in the old days, there was only 10 months in the calendar, and they just kind of ignored winter because you couldn't grow anything during winter. And that's where why you have like September, October, November, December. Because if you actually look at the prefixes, you've got 7, 8, 9, 10. And so they added a couple of months, which was January and February, but back then they only had 29 each. each uh, they only had 29 or 31 days each. Uh, Mars only, I mean, uh, excuse me, March only had 23 days, whatever. That was long, long, long ago before Julius Caesar. And then Julius Caesar, yeah, exactly. Excuse me. And then, of course, when, when to harvest and stuff later on. Uh, and then when to plant certain things and stuff. And then, of course, when to celebrate. And so it became partly agriculture, partly religious, partly market, partly cultural, all those good things. And so in the Julian calendar, you had basically uh, Ju Julius Caesar asked his astronomers to make it a little bit better a calendar. And so they had... Uh, days like we have today, except they added a leap year. The problem with, that, with only adding a leap year was by 1,500 years later, they were off by 10 days. And so uh, Pope Gregory the 12th at that time goes, okay, for anyone listening and, and, and who cares that, that happened to be uh, listening to the Pope, is that um, yesterday was October 4th, and tomorrow's October 15th. So you're not going to find anyone in, say, Italy or stuff like that ever born between October 4th and October 15th because it didn't exist. <laughs> and then later on, because England uh, didn't go with that calendar in the English system, they didn't change. Um, yeah, Gregorian, exactly. They didn't change until 1752, which essentially by then it was off by 12 days. Uh, so they basically said, okay, September 2nd, and then tomorrow September 14th. So you're not going to find anybody in England, for example, that was born between September 12th and or 2nd and 14th, because it didn't exist. Uh, interesting stuff like that. Now, let's take a look at another. I may go over by a couple minutes. If you need to leave, let me know. By the way, for anyone that's actually interested, and I won't go through all the machinations of this, but this is how to calculate Easter. <laughs> um, and what Easter, in other words, it's actually based on, as it says, there's, what, there's not a full moon, it's, what, it's based on a 
cycles from even earlier than that. But basically, it's the full moon on or after the vernal equinox, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so you can tie in. Uh, yeah, uh, the, it, this equation was made a little while ago, but it works just fine. I had to work it out for this year, which is April 12th. And so it works just fine. And then take a look at this one. What's very fascinating is this is the, we just had the year of the rat or Asian New Year. That one is a 60 year cycle, which dates back a long time period. And basically, actually, the one of the 12 year cycles is based on Jupiter's orbit. Um, and so you also, you also have yin and yin. So, for example, the 10 names of the week had to do with growing wood and cut wood. In other words, yang and yin. Or, uh, oh, fire and earth and metal and water. Um, and then you had the 12 earthly branches, which were like the zodiac, and they were yin and yang symbols, like the rat's yang and ox is yin and tiger's yang and rabbit's yin. And so it's very fascinating. I've got a, um, uh, if you look at it, and that's kind of a cyclical uh, calendar. And so let me go, I'm almost done here. And then the last one here that I wanted to take a look at was the Mayan calendar. Now, what's fascinating, again, is the commonalities. You look at Mayan calendar, and you look at the Chinese calendar, and you've got some similar ideas. It's just it's based on, this one's based on Venus instead of Jupiter. And so you've got a 52-year cycle where Venus, which is the patron of war, uh, that's, uh, yes, because the Mayan and the Aztec, essentially the Aztecs adopted a lot of the Mayan religion and calendars and stuff. If you read about where the Aztecs came from, they came from up north near uh, the border. From uh, They believed they came from a cave up uh, north. And then and the Mayan system had been around for a very long time. And then there was one that was in between uh, that had been, but whatever, the, the uh, culture in that area is, is very fascinating if you study some of that and what who adopted what. So the Mayan calendar was also the Aztec calendar. Uh, time is a rolling wheel. Well, if you look at this, you'll see that this is also a rolling wheel. <laughs> In other words, this is the Chinese calendar. And you'll see that it's the same kind of idea. Um, so you've got the Mayan calendar. By the way, I uh, have overlapped two things there. One that shows the days... Uh, uh, in other words, the two cycles, the 260-day cycle and 365-day cycle. And then also, fruit flies. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Okay. But the actual calendar, you might recognize the one in the center. That's about 13 feet in diameter. It's a big one. I saw it in the Archaeological Museum in Mexico City. And so I kind of overlapped two things out of the, um, the web there to show you the whole thing. But the idea there was there, there was... Um, they actually worked on a base, six, base 20 numbering system. And so you had both a civic cycle and a sacred cycle. And it's kind of very complicated. However, comma, and I'll leave you with this idea, is that their calendar was twice as accurate as our current Gregorian calendar. It was accurate to about 13 seconds per year compared to 27 seconds per year for the Gregorian calendar. So here again, uh, this was just, it's kind of an introduction to some of the things having to do with time, the philosophy, how we measure it, the scientific uh, basis of it. And each one of these could be, yes, uh, each one of these could be Tolkien, sacred <laughs> ah, okay, Middle Earth. Uh, okay, so in any case, um, each one of these could be a lecture, in its, I mean, a presentation in its own. Thank you very much for being an animated audience. Thank you for coming today. Uh, I will make a lot of these available so you can touch and get copies of them uh, before the um, virtual world space, uh, what is it, um, best practices in education, all that good stuff like that. And that's my presentation today. Thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it. Uh, any comments, remarks? Yeah, it's a fun talk. I like to do fun talks. I like to do ones where you can kind of think about stuff. And then go back and do your own research. And, and as Chantel uh, mentioned, we've got Darwin Day coming up on the 12th. And we've got another presentation next week. It's always fun and exciting here at uh, Science Circle. <laughs>
There you go. Yay. Okay. Ah, some really good ones. If you haven't seen uh, 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 Delia's um, presentation on uh, fire and rain and wildfire and all that stuff, that should be really interesting. And then the Darwin Day one, if you look at online about what that's about, uh, those are very fascinating ones. So uh, I welcome everybody to join us this next week. Hey, thank you all for coming.